Good day and welcome to the Invent Electric First Quarter 2024 Earnings Conference Call. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Tony Ryder, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, and welcome to NVEN's first quarter 2024 earnings call. On the call with me are Beth Wozniak, our Chair and Chief Executive Officer, and Sarah Zawoyski, our Chief Financial Officer. Today we'll provide details on our first quarter performance, an outlook for the second quarter, and an update to our full year outlook. Before we begin, let me remind you that any statements made about the company's anticipated financial results are forward-looking statements subject to future risks and uncertainties, such as the risks outlined in today's press release and immense filings with the Security and Exchange Commission. Forward-looking statements are made as of today, and the company undertakes no obligation to update publicly such statements to reflect subsequent events or circumstances. Actual results could differ materially from anticipated results. Today's webcast is accompanied by a presentation, which you can find in the, in, in the investor section of MBET's website. References to non-GAAP financials are reconciled in the appendix of the presentation. We'll have time for questions after our prepared remarks. With that, please turn to slide three, and I'll now turn the call over to Beth. Thank you, Tony, and good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be with you today to share our first quarter results. We had another great quarter. We continue to execute on our growth strategy focused on high growth verticals, new products, global expansion, and acquisitions. We had impressive volume growth, margin expansion, and robust free cash flow. We continue to see AI accelerate demand for our data solutions offerings. We also recently published our 2023 sustainability report, which highlights significant progress on our ESG goals including adding two new goals. Overall, we are pleased with the strong start to the year and are raising our full year adjusted EPS guidance. Now on to slide four for a summary of our first quarter performance. First quarter sales were up 18%. On an organic basis, sales grew 5% on top of 8% growth a year ago with growth across all geographic regions. New products contributed over three points to our sales growth, and we launched 17 new products in the quarter. Orders in the quarter grew low single digits, and sellout through our key distribution partners remained positive. We believe the distribution channel has largely completed their inventory adjustments. From a segment standpoint, enclosures had strong sales growth driven by data solutions. As expected, Electrical and fastening solutions was down due to a decline in infrastructure with customer and channel inventory normalization. Thermal management continued to improve sequentially and we believe is positioned for growth the rest of the year. Looking at our key verticals, infrastructure led the way, up low teens with data solutions growing strong double digits. Industrial grew low single digits with all segments up. Commercial resi also grew low single digits. And finally, energy was down impacted by our exit from Russia a year ago. Turning to organic sales by geography, we continued to see broad-based growth led by North America up mid single digits, Europe grew low single digits, and Asia Pacific grew high single digits with solid growth in China. Lastly, segment income grew 30% year over year with return on sales up an impressive 200 basis points. Adjusted EPS grew 15% on top of 34% a year ago, and free cash flow grew 41% year over year. Looking ahead, for full year guidance, we are maintaining our sales outlook and raising our adjusted EPS range, reflecting our strong start to the year. 
We expect electri electrification, sustainability, and digitalization to continue to drive demand. We're on track for another great year. From a vertical perspective, we expect infrastructure to have the strongest growth, benefiting from the electrification and digitalization trends. We expect continued strong growth in data solutions, particularly our liquid cooling solutions given the acceleration of AI. In commercial, we anticipate modest growth with residential being soft. In energy, we expect growth driven by the energy in transition, in particular LNG, clean fuels, carbon capture, and hydrogen. Overall, I'm proud of our Invent team and how we continue to perform and deliver impressive results. I will now turn the call over to Sarah for further detail on our first quarter results and our updated outlook for 2024. Sarah, please go ahead. Thank you, Beth. Let's begin on slide five with our first quarter results. We are off to a great start to the year. Organic sales growth and adjusted EPS exceeded guidance and execution was strong. Sales of $875 million were up 18% relative to last year, or 5% organically. Volumes were up four points and price added one point to growth. Acquisitions added $98 million to sales or 13 points to growth. Foreign exchange was roughly flat. First quarter segment income was $192 million, up 30%, with incrementals of 33%. Return on sales was 22%, up 200 basis points year over year. Price plus productivity, more than offset investments, and total inflation of roughly $20 million. As expected, the ECM acquisition was accretive to return on sales. Q1 adjusted EPS was $0.77, cents, up 15%, and above the high end of our guidance range. Acquisitions contributed a strong $0.06 cents in the quarter. We generated robust free cash flow of $74 million, up 41% compared to a year ago, reflecting our strong operational performance. Now please turn to slide six for a discussion of our first quarter segment performance. Starting with enclosures, the team delivered a fantastic quarter. Sales of $440 million increased 13%. The TEXA acquisition added two points to sales. Organically, sales increased 11% on top of 11% growth a year ago. This included high single-digit volume growth and positive price. Infrastructure grew strong double digits, led by data solutions. Industrial and commercial resi each grew low single digits. Geographically, North America led up low teens, followed by Europe up mid single digits. Enclosure's first quarter segment income was $95 million, up 15%. Return on sales of 21.6% increased 50 basis points year over year, driven by strong growth and execution, while we continue to make significant growth investments. Moving to electrical and fastening, sales of $292 million increased 42%. The ECM acquisition contributed 44 points to sales growth. Organic sales were down 3%, reflecting positive price and lower volumes. Industrial and commercial resi each grew in the quarter. This was more than offset by a decline in infrastructure due to customer and channel inventory normalization and a strong prior year comparison. Geographically, organic sales declined in North America and Europe while Asia Pacific was up. Electrical and fastening segment income was $85 million, up 39% year-over-year. Return on sales was 29.2%, down 60 basis points, mainly due to lower volumes and the impact of the ECM acquisition. Turning to thermal management, sales of $143 million were down 1% organically. The Russia impact was approximately four points to growth. Volumes were down low single digits with positive price. 
Notably, commercial resi continued to improve sequentially and industrial MRO sales remained strong. In addition, backlog grew year over year and energy transition represents over a third of the project backlog. Geographically, growth was led by Asia Pacific, while North America and Europe declined. Thermal management segment income of $32 million was up 3%. Return on sales of 22.3% was up 80 basis points year over year due to strong execution and favorable mix. On slide seven, titled balance sheet and cash flow, we ended the quarter with $211 million of cash on hand and $600 million available on our revolver. We believe our healthy balance sheet provides us with ample capacity to invest in the business and execute on our growth strategy. So turning to slide eight, where we outline our capital allocation priorities. We continue to prioritize growth and execute a balanced and disciplined approach to capital allocation to deliver great returns. We had strong free cash flow in the quarter, growing 41% year over year. As a result, we exited Q1 with a net debt to adjusted EBITDA ratio of 1.9 times. As previously announced, our quarterly dividend increased 9%, returning $32 million to shareholders. We believe we are well positioned for capital deployment in 2024. Moving to slide nine and our full year outlook, we continue to expect reported sales growth of eight to 10% with organic growth in the range of three to 5%. This includes positive price and strong volume growth for the year. And acquisitions are expected to contribute approximately five points to growth. We are raising our full year adjusted EPS range to $3.22 to $3.30, up five to 8%, versus our original guidance of $3.17 to $3.27. We now expect segment income to grow 10 to 12% for the, for, for the year, versus eight to 11% previously. This raised guidance reflects the strong start to the year. All other modeling assumptions for the full year remain unchanged. Looking at our second quarter outlook on slide 10, we expect organic sales to be up three to 5%. For segment organic sales growth, we expect enclosures to lead with high single digit growth, electrical and fastening to be similar to Q1 and thermal management to turn positive. We expect adjusted EPS to be between 81 and 83 cents, which at the midpoint reflects 6% growth relative to last year. Wrapping up, I am pleased with our first quarter performance. We delivered strong growth, margin expansion, and robust cash flow, and are well positioned for another great year. This concludes my remarks, and I will now turn the call back over to Beth. Thank you, Sarah. Turning to slide 11, I would like to provide an update on our data solutions business. The acceleration of AI, greater data consumption, rising heat densities, and growth in edge computing are all drivers of demand for our data solutions offerings. We have a broad and innovative portfolio that includes liquid cooling, smart power distribution, cable management, enclosures, racks and cabinets, and leak detection and sensing solutions. We believe we're well positioned to grow with the significant data center infrastructure investments driven by the acceleration of AI. Today, only 5% of data centers are liquid cooled. With the technology shift to the new AI chips, liquid cooling is an imperative. In addition, liquid cooling can provide up to 50% energy savings and reduce power consumption. We estimate liquid cooling will grow three times faster than conventional air cooling and represent roughly 25% of data center cooling by 2028. We believe we are a leader in this space and are able to provide a broad range of solutions, be it liquid to air, air to liquid, or liquid to liquid for both greenfield and retrofit. We have offered liquid cooling solutions for over 15 years, starting in industrial applications. 
We have developed technical application expertise and manufacturing and supply chain capabilities. Today, we are partnering with major data center players. Our innovative solutions, along with our ability to manufacture at scale, positions us to win in this rapidly growing space. We are also building out a portfolio of standard products to drive broader adoption and scale through distribution channels. We view cooling and power to be the fastest growing areas, which now make up 50% of our data solution business. In the first quarter, we completed the move of our distribution center in Minnesota to a new location, freeing up that space to expand our liquid cooling capacity. We expect this new space to come online in Q3 and give us the ability to expand capacity fourfold. Lastly, we continue to expect our data solutions business to be over $500 million this year. Please turn to slide 12 Title 2023 Sustainability Report. At Invent, we are building a more sustainable and electrified world. Our commitment to sustainability is integral to how we operate, and we took measurable steps to improve our impact in 2023. Last month, we published our latest sustainability report that highlights the significant progress we've made across our people, products, and planet pillars. Our people pillar focuses on inclusion, diversity, employee engagement, safety, and integrity. In 2023, we increased global representation of women in management by 4%, 4 percentage points, improving diversity of leadership. Safety of our employees is a key priority, and in 2023, we improved our total recordable incident rate by more than 20%. We believe our people and culture are a differentiator and our efforts are focused on making Invent a great place to work. Our products pillar focuses on developing highly innovative solutions that deliver efficiency, safety, and reduced resource consumption, creating a more sustainable future. In 2023, 85% of products in our new product introduction funnel had a positive ESG impact, and we're on track to get to greater than 90% by 2025. We set a new goal to eliminate single-use plastics from our product packaging by 2030. Through our innovative products and solutions, we are helping our customers build a more sustainable and electrified world. For example, our electrical connection solutions, which include grounding and bonding, grounding and power connections, add resiliency to critical electrical systems. Our solutions include flexible bus bars, with a bending radius much smaller than that of cable, which enables space and material savings. Alongside benefits of easy, easier installation, these higher current density conductors allow renewable energy and utility customers to meet the demands of increasingly complex applications. Our planet pillar focuses on responsible energy, waste, and water management to help protect our natural resources. In 2023, we reduced total greenhouse gas emissions by 9%, increased renewable energy consumption to 15%, and increased energy-efficient LED lighting in our facilities to 89%. These are measurable steps, and to further demonstrate our commitment to environmental stewardship, we set a new goal to reduce water consumption by 25% by 2030. I'm very proud that we've been recognized for our efforts. We were awarded a gold sustainability rating from EcoVadis, placing us in the top 3% of companies assessed in our industry and in the 93rd percentile of all companies assessed. We were also recognized as one of America's greenest companies by Newsweek. We were named for the first time to the Fortune Best Workplaces in Manufacturing and Production list. And most recently, Invent was recognized as one of the world's most ethical companies by Ethisphere. Our sustainability efforts are key to our strategy and how we operate. I'm very proud of everything we have accomplished and the journey we are on. Wrapping up on slide 13, we are off to a strong start to the year with record Q1 sales and adjusted EPS. We have made significant progress on our ESG goals, and we believe we are well positioned with the electrification of everything, sustainability, and digitalization trends. I am proud of our team's performance. Our future is bright. 
With that, I will now turn the call over to the operator to start Q&A. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then 1 on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. If at any time your question has been addressed and you would like to withdraw your, qu your question, please press star, then 2. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question comes from Dean Dre with RBC Capital. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Nice start to the year. Good morning, Dean. Hey, uh, lots of new data points here on slide 11 regarding your liquid cooling positioning and capacity. So that's the first question, is that 4X expansion in your capacity. I had been talking about and thinking it was 2X. So obviously much bigger here where so you, you identify you have a new plant but so the run rate by the end of this year this is the 4x capacity and how much of this capacity is already spoken for in terms of your your line of sight on visibility of demand so maybe a sense of utilization well we expect some of this capacity to start to come online um, through the back half of the year, and I mean that's going to continue to grow into 2025. So when we talk at 4x capacity, some of that's the space. We have to continue to build out our labs, for example, and some of those lines. So we believe that that capacity supports the growth that we see this year and enables us, and we have some visibility into 2025, and certainly we're working on testing some configurations with uh, various customers, and that test process takes some while, but we're just anticipating that that, you know, gets us through 25, 26, and we'll see beyond that where it takes us to. And I think, Dean, to comment on the 2X, recall we've done a couple of things. First, we expanded capacity because we moved some lines out of our facility in Minnesota to Mexico, so that was our first expansion in the footprint that we had. Then we moved this distribution center out so that we could expand even further, because that was the fastest thing that we could do to get capacity up online. That's uh, uh, great visibility then, So, and I appreciate how, how nimble your manufacturing capacity has ramped up. And then just a second question, there's another new data point here, for us at least, the uh, identifying liquid cooling growing three times faster than legacy. And so legacy air, in our view, has been growing roughly mid-teens. So that looks like a step up in the growth versus the greater than 30% you had been saying. Is that uh, a fair assessment? Uh, we think that it, has, that it has increased from what we've seen previously. And so recall, we had a very strong quarter with data solutions. Great, thank you. Our next question comes from Julian Mitchell with Barclays. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, good morning. Good morning. Maybe just wanted to start with um, the sort of price cost and, and gross margin dynamics. Um, so I think you said um, inflation was a 20 million headwind in Q1, so price cost was negative maybe 14 million or so in the first quarter. Um, just a, a couple of things on that. One is, um, is that why the gross margin declined year on year despite the, the volume growth? And then secondly, how should we think about that price cost dynamic uh, playing out in your um, kind of segment income bridge for the balance of the year? Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with, you know, coming into this year, you know, we said it's, got, it's going to be a combination, and this is consistent with how we've run the business for years, um, of price plus productivity, you know, offsetting that total inflation, which includes material, labor, and everything else, as well as helping to fund those investments. And so we think Q1 played out exactly how we would have expected it to um, and how we expect the year to play out as well. Um, and then secondly, I would say from a price perspective, we said, look, you know, we want positive price this year. And again, we saw that play out across all three segments in Q1. 
Um, and importantly, productivity was going to play a more meaningful um, role, you know, in offsetting inflation and again helping us fund those investments. And we had also said, and we saw this play out really nicely here in Q Q1, and we would expect that to continue in the course of the year, that while we were getting some um, productivity in material and logistics last year, we weren't really getting that core four-wall productivity, and we began to see that here in Q1. So as you think about, you know, price for the full year, you know, we continue to expect that to be positive price. Um, and when we think about that dynamic of, you know, price, you know, inflation, productivity, there's nothing really to call out specifically, you know, through the course um, of Q2 in the back half. The one thing that I will call out, um, and that is impacting, you know, margins, you know, in Q2 here in the back half, is just um, the increased investments. You know, part of that's going to be on the R&D side. You saw that in Q1. It was up 9% from where we're at in Q4. Um, but also these investments around capacity, which we believe has, you know, great um, ROI to it as well. And Sarah, just on that point, the, the $20 million number you mentioned earlier in the call, is that investment plus in inflation or just inflation? That's just inflation. So that means that productivity was, you know, meaningful, you know, to help offset that product, uh, that inflation as well as help some some fund some of those investments like the higher higher R&D. Absolutely. And and my follow up would just be on the um EFS um division um just maybe help us understand kind of within infrastructure that destocking is it around utilities or some other um vertical and and how we should think about the sort of margins playing out at EFS over the the balance of the year please so when you look at EFS uh where we saw that infrastructure weakness was utility and telecom and just uh, part of this is uh last year we had very high comps i think we were up 40% in utility and so as lead times normalized and inventory not only at dis distributors but at the channel, that's what we saw. And telecom, I think, is just a softer uh, market condition. So those are the key, two key drivers. Thanks very much. And, and for margin, I'll let Sarah just comment on that. Yeah. So from an overall margin standpoint, um, just remember that while ECM is uh, accretive to overall invent, you know, it's dilutive to, um, to, to EFS more specifically. And I think the other thing I would call out just as you think about um, where we're guiding to in Q2, it, we do expect some margin contraction there in EFS because of that ECM uh, dilution, at least a, a half a quarter. Um, you know, but also they begin to lap some pretty amazing return on sales of a year ago at 32% here in Q2 and Q3. And remember, we had called out that they had some mixed benefits there that was um, benefiting those return on sales, but still on an absolute basis, you know, good, healthy return on sales. Thanks so much. Our next question comes from Nigel Coe with Wolf Research. Please go ahead. Thanks. Good morning. Um, uh, wanted to dig, dig back into the price. Um, I thought we were looking for two percent price in um, in 2024. So maybe, maybe I got that wrong, but maybe just uh, clarify that. And so is, is one percent uh, a good number to use through um, uh, through uh, through the year? But um, but really uh, on orders, can you maybe just talk about orders by segment? You know that uh, low single digit order growth. Uh, how that looked across the uh, across the three, the three segments, and then how how does April look? I know it's uh, you just wrapped up April, but uh, how does the deal uh, look for April? So I'll maybe start off on the price side. So you know, in our February call, you know, we talked a lot about you know price and volume, and saying that we would expect positive price, but volume would be a much more significant contribution, you know, to that okay. overall top line, which is exactly the way Q1 played out. Um, and we also said that that price plus productivity was going to help, help offset that total inflation, you know, as well as help and fund those investments, which is what, how Q1 played out. And when we look at the order trends, um, orders were up mid-single digits in electrical and fastening and low single digits in thermal and enclosures. And I think, you know, a April looks like Q1. Okay, that's, that's really helpful. And then on the capacity expansion uh, in liquid cooling, which, which uh, Dean covered quite well, um, 
How does the margin profile for liquid cooling uh, look as you ramp that up? I mean, um, I'm, I'm guessing there's going to be a lot of stock costs and, and whatnot. So uh, does, does that start to drag in a meaningful way or, or measurable way uh, within the segment? Yeah, so that data solutions business, which mostly, you know, largely sits in enclosures, we said it's just roughly on par, you know, from a gross margin standpoint. But, but what we are investing in is that capacity. And as you might expect, as we bring that capacity, you know, online and pay, make some pretty big shifts um, within one of our um, largest factories here in Q2 and Q3 to make room, you know, for that liquid cooling capacity, we are expecting some ramp-up costs, you know, to impact that here in Q2 and Q3, but that's reflected in our overall guidance here in Q2. So does that mean, sorry, I, I don't want to take too much time here, but if, when you think about that price productivity inflation investment bucket together with the ramp-up costs here, do, do we – do we see some potential for negativity uh, in that balance, or do you still think neutral is the right, the right way? No, in the, in the combination of price plus, plus productivity, we expect to offset that inflation and in investments. But if you just look at that kind of net productivity bar, you know, that's where some of those investments are going to flow in, in Q2 okay, and in, in Q3. Yep. Right. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. Our next question comes from Joe Ritchie with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey, can we uh, just talk about the first quarter growth performance? Uh, you know, organically turned out to be a little bit better than we expected, which is great to see. And I guess how much of that was driven by just the data solutions business um, just continuing to be on fire versus the rest of your business? And then really kind of the reason I'm asking is, is as you kind of think about the second quarter, you know, and now that you've lapped some destocking, you've got no rush of, you know, tough comp in 2Q, why wouldn't it step up in 2Q? Well, let me, I'll, I'll start with Q1 and I'll let Sarah refer back to, to guidance again. But uh, we had very strong growth in data solutions in the quarter. And some of that is just a result of some of those, how those customer programs uh, layered in, but that's certainly what gave us some of that significant volume growth is coming from data solutions. And then as we think about that, Joe, from a Q2 perspective, you know, again, we expect, you know, data solutions to grow very nicely here in Q2, just not quite at the levels of Q1. And so that's why, you know, as enclosures printed a, a fantastic 11% organic growth in Q1. You know, we expect that to look more like high single digits here in Q2. The other thing I would point to is just we are expecting to see a bit more softer Europe. Europe was up for us in Q1, and we do expect um, uh, we're taking a bit more of a cautious view on Europe here in Q2. Okay. Yeah, that's the, that's, that makes sense, and, and that's super helpful. Thank you for that. I guess my follow-on question, uh, it was great to, great to see the offerings uh, at Data Center World. Uh, and uh, as I, obviously, it seems like, you know, folks are just running as fast as they possibly can uh, uh, in, the, in that end market. As I think about your own offering, um, there are certain things that you guys do in-house. There are certain things that you guys, you know, outsource. Is there any thought around, you know, potentially, you know, using some of the M&A dollars um, to, 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 to get a little bit bigger, either in the CDU itself or, um, or in other, other areas uh, that, that sell into the data center? Well, as we think about our overall strategy in M&A, um, you know, we always say we look at high growth verticals first. And I think, Joe, I mean, I can point to a couple of acquisitions we've done. We've done six, and, you know, two of them from – um, the WBT wire basket tray contributed to our cable management offering, and the CIS global acquisition contributed to our smart power distribution. So I think as we um, continue to look at M&A, we look at great products in great verticals, and certainly I think you know there's always opportunities there for us to strengthen the portfolio and data solutions, as it is in other infrastructure areas. Okay, great. Thank you. Our next question comes from Jeff Hammond with KeyBank Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hey, Jeff, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, great. 
Um, just a clarification on the um, the capacity expansion of the 4X, does that contemplate a new plant as well? Or is that just simply the moves you've made, you know, creating space? Yeah, that is not a new plant, but it, what we did is we moved out a distribution center that was attached to our main manufacturing facility. We moved that to a new location and then expanded, or are expanding within that area, uh, the liquid cooling capacity. So that's, you know, remember we, were, we expanded in Mexico. That was the first step that created space. Then we moved distribution to a new location and now expanding within that footprint. Okay, great. And then uh, EFS, I think you said thermal is going to return the growth the rest of the year, but how should we think about EFS in the TQ? I know the orders were better. And then just on those orders, is that kind of clear line of sight that, you know, that destocking is, you know, is kind of behind us from here? Let me start by just saying, you know, one of the comments I made is when we look at our distribution channel, we see that we had, there was, um, positive sell-through, so that's good. And we think largely the distribution channels have normalized and stabilized. However, there are some areas, and we called out for EFS, areas like utility, for example, where we know that there's inventory at the end customer and at the channel, and recall we had a very big comp of 40% growth in utilities last year. So some of that we think plays into Q2, but very specific you know, areas. But Overall, I'd say it's largely stabilized. Okay, thanks so much. Yeah, and Jeff, I would just comment on EFS. So EFS, we still expect EFS to grow for the full year. Um, but for Q2, we expect, you know, that Q2 year-over-year -year performance to look a lot like Q1 because we do expect those infrastructure dynamics that Beth talked about to continue into the quarter. And as we think about the back half, a couple things there to keep in mind. One would just be um, comps do get easier. Um, you know, two would be, you know, we do expect that inventory normalization uh, to begin to kind of ease, if you will, you know, in, in the back half, closer to Q4. And I think the last thing I would just point out is the sales synergies for, for ECM as well as uh, EFS and the combination thereof. You know, we think that will begin to later, uh, layer on in the, in the back half of the year. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Jeff Spraga with Vertical Research Partners. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just coming back to uh, the capacity addition, I know you're not going to tell us exactly what your liquid cooling sales are, but I, I just kind of want to understand what 4X means. Um, I mean, does it literally mean if you had, you know, $50 million of revenue in liquid cooling in 2023, you believe you have $200 million in 2025? Is it, is it directly correlated to kind of a revenue run rate? Well, no, not, not, not precisely. I would say this, when we look at the footprint space, this is what we're referring to. And so it will take us some time to build out some of the lines as well as we're expanding our lab capability because one of the things with these solutions is it goes under extensive testing within our labs as well as our customers, you know, in situ. So. Um, we will have the footprint, and eventually that will expand our capacity from a, a volume, a unit volume. Understood. Um, and then just back to the thermal, um, yeah, clearly with the, the Russia headwind behind us, uh, we would expect it to return to growth. But can you be a little bit more specific on what you're seeing there, you know, kind of in the, you know, in the served end markets in thermal that would underpin kind of the return to growth and how you see that playing out, you know, uh, maybe even kind of into next year, given that I'm sure there's some project activity going on there. Yeah, so as we, uh, in our prepared remarks, you know, we talked about um, we're seeing our backlog up, we're seeing new wins on energy transition. That's an area that we've really focused on, and we see investment flowing there. We certainly had some strong growth in Asia Pacific, as we see industrial and chemical, uh, you know, opportunities, and we continue to sequentially see commercial resi improve in that thermal business. 
So as, as we, uh, this is a uh, Q2 is the last quarter that we left, the Russia exit, we see a, an increased backlog, we see increased orders, and um, generally, you know, a lot of quote activity. So we feel confident that the thermal business is poised for growth the remainder of the year. Great. Thank you. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Our next question comes from Nicole DeBlaze with Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, maybe we could continue with thermal. Um, from a margin perspective, pretty impressive performance up year on year with down sales in the quarter. I guess, how should we think through the rest of the year? Is that is that sustainable? And then I know you guys have put work into you know doing some restructuring in that business as sales have been weak. What can incrementals look like once organic growth does turn positive? I'll maybe start with just the overall incremental question. So you know we were pleased with the incrementals in Q1 at 33%. Um, and overall, you know, we continue to believe that, you know, our business with the strong growth profile, value proposition, and margins, you know, that in a more normal environment, you know, those incrementals will look like, you know, plus 30%. And then I think your question was on thermal management in terms from a return on sales perspective. I would just start by saying well, I think the team's done an excellent job of, you know, managing that cost structure, you know, managing the price-cost equation, um, and really pleased with that overall Q1 return on sales uh, performance. We wouldn't expect that same level of year-over-year -year Ross expansion, you know, here in Q2 um, in the back half, in part because of the projects that Beth talked about. I mean, we, you know, we, we pointed out in Q1 they were benefiting from some favorable mix on the product side. But as that top line returns to growth, and some of that's going to be projects, which still comes at good margins, um, but not quite as good as the product side, you know, that's going to impact that year-over-year -year return on sales perspective. Got it. Very clear. And then maybe on Europe, um, you guys spoke about how you're kind of anticipating maybe some Europe weakness coming through in the second quarter. Is that something that you guys actually saw in your order trends, or are you just being a little bit cautious based on what you're hearing? Thank you. Well, yeah, we did see that in our order trend through Q1, that Europe was definitely softer than North America and Asia Pacific. Thank you. I'll pass it on. Our next question comes from Vlad Bystricki with Citi. Please go ahead. Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Good morning. Um, so, I, I just wanted to follow up on that last question um, and comment uh, from Nicole about, about Europe. Can you just give us more color on, um, you know, what's contemplated in, in guidance for the rest of the year in terms of potential for incremental weakening in Europe going forward? Well, here's what I would say is that, you know, we were pleased with the Q1 performance where we actually um, grew Europe uh, overall in Q1, and so what we're, what we're suggesting here is in that Q2 guide, um, we're not expecting uh, growth here in Europe, um, and I think it really reflects some of the order trends, you know, that Beth alluded to. Okay, uh, that's helpful, thanks. And then, can you, um, can you just give us an update on, on what you're seeing in terms of underlying growth at ECM um, and how you're, um, you know, progressing on, on synergy capture there versus your expectations? Yeah, when we look at ECM, um, that business had, a, you know, a, a several different channels, and I would say ECM has performed very similar to what we've seen our EFS business. I would say they have a stronger retail channel, and so that's retail resi. That's been a little softer, and that was our comments about we expect that to continue to be soft. But I think as uh, we've been working on a lot of our sales synergies, and as Sarah commented on, we expect to see that start to layer in in the back half of the year. And so that is everything from bringing some of that product through our rep and distribution network, as well as into uh, taking some of those products and bringing them, you know, making sure that they're certified so we can bring them into Europe. So all of that activity is underway. And I will say this. You know, one of the things uh, when we acquired that business, they certainly had supply chain challenges and availability challenges, and we worked very hard to improve that situation. And what's been encouraging is that we've seen 
and heard from our customers, we see some of that those you know orders uh, pick up where we've improved the delivery situation. But um, overall, ECM is a great acquisition for us, and we um, and we think it just extends our portfolio in uh, power connection solutions. And so, uh, you know, we we see great potential for the synergies to play you know to play out over the next several years. And maybe just a quick add on the cost synergy side. So I would just say we're well on track. Um, you know, as we acquired ECM, uh, we were really excited about it from the growth side, but we also did see some cost synergies there in that 10 to $15 million mark by year three, and I would say that we're well on track um, to deliver that. We're seeing material, um, procurement synergies, logistics, you know, indirect. Um, I think, too, on the cash tax synergies, um, we now expect closer to $10 million per year versus the 6 to $8 million um, previously that we had discussed. Um, and then lastly, you know, we talked about in 2024 um, with that acquisitions being accretive to EPS and that seven to eight cents, and so we saw a strong six cent, you know, contribution here in Q1. So, um, you know, contribu contributing overall, you know, very nicely. Great. That's uh, that's really helpful. Thanks. I'll get back to you. Thank you. Our last question comes from Brian Drab with William Blair. Please go ahead. Hi, just a couple small clarifications at this point. But in, in EFS, I think that you said that the sell into the channel was up low single digits. The sell through is positive. Um, can you just put a finer point on that? What does positive mean exactly? Does that mean sell through is up slightly year over year? Well, our comment was more around all of Invent, right, that we just saw positive okay. sell through, you know, so low single digits. All right. So positive means low single digits. Yes. Okay. Got it. Okay. And then in the commercial business, um, you mentioned that you know, that things are looking better, uh, or sorry, in the thermal business that you mentioned things are looking better. Commercial and resi um, is is that back to growth in the first quarter, or was it just improving sequentially? And then also, I was curious. You know, you said the energy end market was the only one that was was. Uh, you know, a, a, a trouble point in the first quarter. Does that mean that ener energy was the only end market that you saw decline uh, year over year in the first quarter within thermal? Thanks. So um, I'm just going to, just for clarification, so overall for Invent, commercial resi was positive, and overall for Invent, energy was down, and that was primarily due to the Russia impact. For thermal specifically, we've seen commercial resi improving. So not quite yet back to growth, but it's improved for the last several quarters. And certainly Thermo has been impacted by energy the most because of the Russia impact. And we have one more quarter that will lap here in Q2 with Russia, the Russia exit. Okay, that helps. Thank you very much. This concludes our question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Beth Wozniak, Chair and Chief Executive Officer, for any closing remarks. Thank you for joining us today. I'm very proud of the performance we delivered in the first quarter. We will continue to focus on delivering for our customers, employees, and shareholders by executing on our growth strategy. We believe Invent is a top-tier, high-performance electrical company well-positioned for the electrification of everything, sustainability, and digitalization trends. Thanks again for joining us. This concludes the call. The conference has now concluded. Thank you for attending today's presentation. You may now disconnect.